clinical trial design considerations and optimization related issues for uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, lysosomal diseases, type 1 diabetes, neonatal populations. And for that, I'm going to invite my colleagues Gina and Krista to get started with the next one. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to get started by inviting our panelists to come up to the stage, please. There you are. Yeah, so they can have all this one left. Uh oh. Oh, well, you can have Use it here. Use it here. Talk anyway. <laughs> We're going to start the, the session with um, J Jonathan Jacoby. Uh, he is a parent and advocate, and uh, he has a presentation um, that he's going to provide us with to, to kick the session off. Thank you. So I wanted to introduce you not to myself, but to my son. Um, this is Joshua. He has Neiman Pick type C disease. He was about a year and a half years old when he took up the drums. And um, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, Neiman Pick is a, a neurological disease, neurological lysosomal disease. Um, pretty early on, most kids with Neiman Pick C develop um, problems, writing, reading, um, gait, um, all kinds of eventually uh, cognitive problems. Um, and uh, uh, at, at certain points, you know, the, the body, the brain shuts down and then the body shuts down as a result. And just a couple of examples. The, this is a, a, a girl who had an NPC. Um, she died when she was five years old. Um, just the, the disease just very, very quickly um, took her away from us. Um, this is a guy who's now 30, I think. 30 years old, maybe even a little older. He, um, as you can see, is, 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 uh, is, has, um, you know, he's, he's on a, a feeding tube. This is in, he's in the hospital where he gets his, um, biweekly injection of, uh, cyclodextrin, which I'll talk about in a second. Mm -hmm. And then this is, uh, these are two sisters, um, uh, one of whom, uh, they both have NPC. One of them, the one sitting down is in a wheelchair. The other one lives a, a normal life. So when Joshua was 10 years old, uh, he um, was able to get onto an expanded access of the of a trial with a drug that's now called Adrobated. It's a cyclodextrin. Um, here he is giving his assent uh, in... Uh, Harbor UCLA Hospital with many of you know Patty Dixon, who was the the uh, the investigator for that IIND, um, and then a few weeks later, um, Dr. Agnes Chen uh, administered the first treatment of a cyclodextrin. It's it's given as an um, intrathecal injection. Uh, he gets it every other week. You might be able to see that he's looking at a screen. He has um, for the last. 12 years or so, well, 11 years, been watching, uh, it used to be cartoons, and now it's TV shows that I don't really want to listen to, uh, uh, as he gets, uh, without any any anesthesia, just a little bit of, of, uh, of numbing cream um, as he gets his treatment. So... Um, Joshua, this these are Joshua in his high school and junior high school years. He continued to play the drums, as you can see. He um, the 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 photograph on the right where he's outside. Um, you can see maybe that he has a mask. That was his audition for college uh, on the beach because we couldn't be inside. And then uh, now he's at uh, Arizona State University. He uh, every Friday night uh, for services at the local Hillel, he plays uh, this. I think it's called uh, 
well, I forgot. It's it's a percussion instrument. And now, j just a, I wanted to show you. It's it's thirty seconds. Uh, what Joshua was like today. This is a, a couple years ago, but he's exactly like this today. Um, this is remember a disease that takes away um, all kinds of skills, all kinds of abilities. Um, coordination being one of the first ones. Um, I. And here we go. Thanks. Well, that's great. And I think um, a great way to start this, we're, we're going to take your perspective too about being in this clinical trial and, and expand on this about design optimization through this session. Um, so uh, first question, we'll get going. So I'm going to put this to from a regulatory perspective, kind of drop it down after that patient, really good patient perspective and ask what are the key areas that regulators want researchers and industry to focus on that could be common across the lifespan and relevant in different trials for these conditions and kind of pass that on to Yulia to start. Um, good morning, everyone. Well, actually, it's afternoon already, um, you know, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you very much for uh, inviting us to be part of this discussion. Um, you know, it, it's very important and we're here to collaborate with all of you to get um, the, you know, those important treatments to the patients in need. Um, what this... Um, challenging in, in product development and lysosomal uh, diseases as it is in with, is with many rare diseases, um, you know, that uh, the natural history of the disease is um, really poorly characterized. There's also, um, you know, uncertainties about correlation between the genotype and phenotype and diseases. There's also <clears throat> um, problems with uh, delays um, in, in diagnosis and uh, therefore um, limiting the number of patients available for uh, trial in, in enrollment um, that will potentially have a response to, um, to those uh, disease-modifying therapies. Uh, there's significant heterogeneity in the um, uh, clinical presentations of um, in, in these uh, lysosomal diseases that... Um, it really hampers the development identification of the uh, clinical endpoints that are meaningful to patients and yet uh, very sensitive uh, to change in the context of clinical trials. The diseases are chronic um, and slowly progressing, thus uh, requiring the trials that are very long, that are very difficult to maintain um, to obtain the needed uh, evidentiary information about the efficacy of the products. Well, we can see that the, their potential solution to this, and of course, the, the first and foremost, um, that is so important to characterize the natural history of the disease um, um, progression. And the data, you know, of course, can come from dedicated uh, natural history studies, from observational studies, from the placebo arms of the uh, investigational <clears throat> Investigational trials, interventional trials, um, the um, the databases and, and registries um, that are maintained by academia as well as the patient groups. So, you know, coming together in this forum, it's so important to pull the data to allow the, um, the the collection of the data and also mining of the data to identify 
um, the patient population, um, you know, and we, we um, you know, time and again hear, hear that there might be uh, patient groups um, in, in these diseases where uh, the course of the disease um, is, uh, could be, you know, fairly well characterized and is amenable to investigation in clinical trials that are relatively circumscribed. You know, once we identify those patient population and be able to identify where, what is the clinical endpoint that could be easily measured and provide the, that scientific, valid scientific evidence on the uh, product efficacy, um, in addition to um, collection and characterization biomarkers, um, whether, um, you know, these are laboratory biomarkers, imaging biomarkers, whatnot, you know, the, uh, the target engagement specific and non-specific biomarkers that uh, reflect the disease progression and then also response to treatment, these data could be used uh, to potentially validate um, the, the biomarker for use in, in these diseases and potentially streamline the product development um, for the other subgroups um, in the patient population uh, in lysosomal storage diseases. So I think that that is, um, you know, what we're here for. We're here to engage with the patient community, the industry, um, and <clears throat> other federal partners, as well as academicians, in order to create those databases that right now seem to be very disjointed, dispersed across different development programs programs. Um, and uh, with a number of patients being so limited, you know, we really are struggling to um, to pull the data together in order to get to get to the informed decision about the particular biomarker and or clinical outcome. Thank you, Leah. And, and I think that, you know, that that really kind of uh, leads us to kind of expand on that question a little bit. Obviously, in LDA, as we launched the consortium, uh, we're specifically focused on biomarkers, but there's a lot of overlap with, with alpha one and, uh, you know, the, the gaps and then the un unmet needs. So I just kind of want to expand that question and, and to the, the rest of the panel, what do you see as from the industry perspective, from regulatory and from the patient perspective, what are, what do you feel the focus could, you know, cause we're trying to utilize this, this consortium effort to guide, you know, the, the most effective and efficient uh, means forward. So that perspective from, from each of you will, you know, is really interesting. Gavin, you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, so I'll say, you know, first, the, the first thing I want to transmit from the, from the FDA CBER perspective is um, our enthusiasm for, uh, for all of the, the products that are being um, developed uh, for for alpha one um, in in the domain of gene and cell therapy, um, I'm sitting next to John Hagstrom, who we all heard from yesterday, who's um, truly a hero. He is somebody who received a double lung transplant for a condition that we may now be able to successfully treat with with a gene therapy. I mean, if that doesn't blow your mind, what will? Um, so that's that's really the the, the first point that I think. Um, it's worthwhile stepping back and, and realizing that um, we're sitting on the on the precipice of a potential revolution for um, uh, for not only this disease but for others that um, that have followed a similar um, uh, paradigm where you know the only viable treatment was replacement of of an end organ. Um, I will say you know there are a, a variety of, of of really nuanced regulatory considerations for development for um, from alpha one and and those. Yeah, can we have you talk up a little bit? We're having trouble hearing you on the panel. Just sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Um, so I think there there's several um, unique considerations for alpha one that owe to. Um, the the regulatory landscape that's that's taken shape um, over the many years that there have been um, approved products. Um, we're conceiving of uh, supporting development for newer genetic based therapies for alpha one um, in potentially very different ways than uh, previously, and that follows logically, of course, because the approved products. I mean, imagine the manufacturing and the clinical design considerations for for products that. Um, are from uh, from pooled plasma um, that are you know infused um, on a monthly basis as a as a chronic maintenance therapy versus um, a gene therapy which might have a 
totally different ROA, totally different MOA, um, and and a totally different um, schedule and a whole slew of of, of attendant considerations for uh, for clinical study design. So we are really approaching this with um, with an open mind. Um, our um, engagement in this particular um, initiative that CPATH has so brilliantly um, put together is, um, I think, a great first step towards. Um, getting a handle on what these refined specific um, questions are um, that we plan to address from the from the regulatory perspective. But the 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 most critical message that that I want to convey from FDA's perspective is um, our our openness and our enthusiasm. So um, I, I hope that the, the the patients feel that, and I hope that the um, the industry sponsors know that. Um, that we're approaching this really with with fresh eyes and um, uh, and a lot of enthusiasm and um, and really hope tremendously and earnestly for your success because your successes are our successes and most importantly their successes for the patients. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, this is my second panel. I recommend being a panelist. The chairs are very comfortable. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so in in terms of clinical trial design, um, you know, my message, which very much for Alpha One community, but also, but I, I share it um, is valid for for really any um, indication, is get patients involved early. Um, we have uh, a very, we're very fortunate to have a, quite a big pipeline of, of new therapies and development, as Gavin mentioned, and uh, you know, some of those sponsors have come work with us uh, you know, at the very beginning of the trial design process. Um, to take our input, both uh, from patient point of view, as well as, um, you know, from the point of view of our experts who have run a lot of these. And so, you know, we find that we can make it uh, often make cha little changes, suggest changes that make it much more palatable and easier to recruit, which is at the end of the day, in a rare disease, the, uh, you know, the biggest problem in, in clinical trials. Um, and, uh, and sometimes um, I, I'm no expert in trial, trial design myself, but I've been um, involved enough to realize that it's not entirely, uh, it's not 100% science. It's like 90% science and 10% art, um, especially when it comes to, you know, defining precise inclusion and exclusion criteria. And, um, you know, we find that, you know, we have a, a we do a lot of recruiting. We, um, we help our sponsors recruit for trials. And, and, you know, we find that sometimes you can tweak those numbers just a little bit and, and might have a, a pretty large uh, impact on um, the potential pa patient population you can reach. So, you know, it's. I think it's really in uh, it's in sponsors' interest and very much in the patient's interest to to get um, to get the patient community involved early. Well, thank you again uh, also for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in this panel, and I think from uh, the industry perspective on Alpha One, maybe uh, also from a patient perspective, I think if I put myself on the patient's shoes, I want to be cured. But what does it mean, a cure for alpha-1 liver disease? So I think we have to be clear about how we define that and how we measure it. And uh, understanding ways that we can do it. Also thinking in terms of the trial design, I think uh, Yulia covered well many of the challenges that also apply to alpha-1. And here we are dealing, if we recall yesterday, uh, Dr. Tackman mentioning about the liver being a silent disease. So it makes it even harder to identify patients early on. So those are some of the challenges. And there is also this overlap between lung and liver that can occur. And I think we, when we are designing the study, we have to be careful also to make uh, the selection on the inclusion exclusion criteria, as John mentioned, uh, carefully so that we can still make it representative of the population that will use uh, these therapies when, uh, once it's in the market. So uh, it's crafting this uh, with the 10% art that you mentioned. I think it's definitely uh, a thing to consider and keep in mind uh, and balancing out what uh, we know uh, about the disease itself that uh, it's, I think, well characterized from uh, the lung disease probably even more than on the liver side and balancing out uh, what we still don't know with what we need to collect in a manner that uh, can be tolerable to the patient as well in terms of the study burden on the patient. Thinking this is a, a rare disease, we won't have 
thousand sites across the country. So patients will often have to travel far to go to the sites. And if they have to go too often, this will impact their lives, their work, and may prevent them from participating. So I think we have to find the right balance. It's this 10% art that John mentioned that I think needs to be refined so that uh, it can be uh, a study that will generate the information that we need, that will support the needs from the patients, from the regulators, from all parties involved, but at the same time, that is uh, doable from a patient perspective and also from the industry. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Siegel. I'm Office Director for the Office of Drug Evaluation Sciences in the Center for Drugs at FDA. Um, my office is responsible for the biomarker qualification program. Yulia gave a comprehensive view, um, from my point of view, of um, what we need to uh, conduct efficient clinical trials in uh, these rare diseases. But I think um, maybe I can um, add a little bit more uh, about the importance of biomarkers and how developing good biomarkers can help with uh, clinical trial design. So <clears throat> biomarkers um, can be uh, used in a number of different ways to make clinical trials uh, smaller and quicker to be able to show uh, clinical benefit to patients. One important uh, use of biomarkers is to define a patient population uh, who's most likely to develop the outcomes of interest. Um, if you can uh, um, identify biomarkers that define a patient population that uniformly progresses uh, with their disease, and you can show that a therapeutic agent, by treating them, prevents those outcomes, um, that can be very useful evidence uh, and can simplify the conduct of a clinical trial. Um, another type of biomarker is a pharmacodynamic biomarker. And pharmacodynamic biomarkers can be helpful um, in showing that a drug um, hits its target and that the dose that's been being selected is optimal for providing a clinical benefit to patients. So developing uh, pharmacodynamic biomarkers uh, is also important. Another kind of biomarker is a monitoring biomarker. And this can be imaging biomarkers, as uh, Yulia talked about, or a blood-based uh, um, lab test, um, which reflects something important about the um, disease itself. So you could consider CT lung density potentially to be a monitoring biomarker, so long as it can be shown to um, uh, correlate with the clinical outcomes of interest, such as uh, for alpha-1 antitrypsin, that would be mortality and need for a uh, lung transplant. Um, and then the other type of biomarker that can be particularly useful um, is a surrogate endpoint biomarker, either a validated surrogate endpoint biomarker that can be used for traditional approval or a reasonably likely uh, surrogate endpoint biomarker that can be used for uh, accelerated approval where a confirmatory trial later shows that the benefit on the biomarker extends to a benefit for uh, clinical outcomes. Um, I think that one important point is that to validate a biomarker often requires pulling data from a number of different sources. So having consortia uh, bring together the patient voice about what's important to them, uh, with um, industry, academics, um, regulatory um, uh, input um, to pull the data sets together and get the resources necessary to validate biomarkers to make these clinical trials um, easier to conduct uh, to be able to show uh, the drugs have clinical benefit for patients. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, hello. Nice to be here. I'm Christine Daly. I'm a child neurologist. I worked in clinics for 25 years in the Center of Rare Disorders. And uh, the last eight years I've been in uh, biotech developing for NPC. And uh, I, I, of course, totally agree with what Dr. Siegel said around the biomarkers. But I think we have not talked uh, a lot about the clinical outcome that should end up validating uh, the biomarkers that we end up choosing. 
And uh, I could I could really think that it's important that we also collect uh, data of disease progression um, when we are developing our biomarkers in order to get them there. And another point is that we all know it will take a long time to get the biomarkers we all need uh, for these diseases, as most of them are diagnostic biomarkers now and not related uh, to any progression. So what do we do in the meantime? How do we get uh, treatment out to patients uh, before that point? So um, I have some thoughts on biomarkers, but I think I'll hold off on those for a second. I, I wanted, I'm, I'm reinforcing some of the points that were made, but uh, I, in, in my son's disease and in so many of these, variability um, uh, and the in both in terms of the course of the disease and the severity of inc of uh, symptoms is just so great that clinical trials are very very difficult and placebo trials. Uh, I mean, if you just remember that photograph of the two girls, one of them was in a trial on the placebo, and she degenerated so quickly that she was taken off of the placebo and given the drug. And the other one was given the drug, and she's still doing great. So uh, if that's a sort of an ethical issue to think about. I, I, did, I have the following suggestions, which I think reinforce most of the suggestions that have been made. First of all, just use all the data that's available, including natural history. Um, patients can be their own controls. Uh, uh, there, uh, you know, the, an individual severity scale before they took the drug, um, and and, ha and where they are in the severity scale, two years on, three years on, we have that data already, at least in NPC, but in other diseases, uh, a lot from expanded access. Uh, my my son is one of I think sixty or so uh, people who are in ex expanded access. I may be off, but a lot of them. Um, just. Two other things. One is uh, about conditional approval. I, I, you know, as a parent, I think we have all we need for conditional approval. I'm, I'm sure that there are some things that we may still need, but it sure feels like when I look at all the data that, and I've looked at all the data, and I look at the kids, and I see what this particular drug has done, that let's give it conditional approval. So, and then continue to do the trials. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to say is that when it comes to um, deciding what kind of risks um, ought to be taken, uh, pay attention to what the parents and sometimes the patients say. Uh, you know, um, cyclodextrin, the drug that my son gets, has a, a serious side effect. Uh, my son is, uses a hearing aid. He's lost a good deal of his hearing. He's a happy kid. You can see he's just a happy kid. And he's uh, he's happy to be alive. And that's OK if he has to wear hearing aids. He hasn't complained about them once. I, I kind of want to bring it back to the patient perspective, kind of to continue on um, between uh, the perspective, John, you have as as a direct patient living with it versus a parent and what you're looking for as far as um, what researchers and industry should focus on and could be common across the lifespan um, from considering a pediatric involvement and long-term follow-up potentially and what that translates to as he becomes an adult, but also being a participant as an adult and faced with um, what kind of where you want to see um, uh, these trials go for these different conditions and what, what's important to you. It's just really hard to say. What's important to me is that my son live, um, but it's no less important or it's a different kind of important that he be able to function well, that he can stay in college and all of these things. It, it's just hard. I mean, you can't measure um, whether he's going to be able to live. There's The measuring of that is the worst thing to have to consider. But, so you can measure things like basically neurological neurological function, I think, is the best indicator. Uh, so that's what I would say. Um, well, I, you know, there's a there's a it's it's an interesting 
I studied ethics for a little while, and there's a in, in, very interesting ethical problem. And I, I am so grateful to the FDA because you take this stuff into account. Um, and in the 21 years that I have been a father of a child with nematic type C disease, um, the, the people who've been most receptive and most helpful um, outside of those scientists who are working on it, have often been people in government. And um, I'm a big believer in government. I know that's not popular these days, but I'm a big believer in government. So one of the things that I, I would love to be able to see is some way of uh, looking at the texture of an issue, right? Seeing where the ethics are, where the, where the parents' um, priorities are, what the science says, and there, there's no algorithm for it. Uh, but I think there's a way of making decisions uh, maybe a little bit more expeditiously, because in the end, I'm, we're racing against time. And so the, the hearing is, is a good example. You may know that at one point, the the approval of this particular drug was held up because there was a concern about hearing loss. Not one parent I know is worried about hearing loss for their child with this disease. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, with Alpha, one of the things I'd like to see uh, more of is the use of um, patient reported outcomes, in particular, um, the St. George Respiratory Qu Questionnaire. Um, it's, it's been shown that the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire, um, you know, the, the changes in, in results do correlate with changes in lung function and stuff. The problem has been traditionally that, uh, you know, to actually use that to um, to show significance would take literally half the, you know, population of, of known alphas in the United States and several years. But um, what we saw recently with one trial is if you focus on, there's three parts of that questionnaire, and if you focus on the activity domain, then you can actually, um, th that, that could uh, be useful. And um, you can actually see uh, significant changes in a relatively short period of time without, you know, recruiting 5,000 people. In fact, uh, we had a clinical, there's a clinical trial for a oral uh, neutrophil assays inhibitor um, that's proposing to use that uh, as a primary endpoint. So I, I don't know how... Um, feasible that is, or, or what were there in those discussions. But um, at the very least, I, I would love to see that um, brought into play more, at least as a secondary endpoint. That could also add some weight to some of the, um, you know, I, I think a reasonable change there could also just add some heft to the to the case for the sponsor, that, that this is a good product. Thank you. Uh, you know, in, in that context, uh, Dr. Siegel spoke initially about the the different types of biomarkers, and obviously there there's a uh, a wide range of types of uh, biomarkers. So I, I'm going to put this back to you, Dr. Siegel. Um, can you comment on how sponsors and regulatory um, agencies can uh, use biomarkers to accelerate drug development or, you know, not, not necessarily accelerate, but really try to have a comprehensive approach to, uh, towards uh, validation or um, identification of, of applicable biomarkers? Sure. So it's important to recognize that there are several pathways to use of biomarkers in clinical development programs. Um, one is um, through a process that was put into place by the U.S. Congress with the uh, 21st Century Cures Act, which is the qualification program that uh, we oversee in my office. <clears throat> in this program, uh, a requester, a uh, biomarker developer, will submit a, a proposal to the FDA in a letter of intent to um, uh, let us know that they're planning to develop a biomarker for a particular purpose. Uh, once it's accepted, they'll send in uh, their qualification plan, then they'll collect their data, analyze it, and submit it as a full qualification package. If the data are supportive of use of the biomarker for that particular context of use in clinical trials, then the FDA will qualify the biomarker. And then it's posted publicly on an FDA website, and any um, pharmaceutical company can incorporate that biomarker into their clinical development program 
for that particular context of use without having to do further work to uh, validate it. Um, but that can be a long process, uh, collecting all the information and, and uh, analyzing it and so on. And it's not required to use the biomarker in a clinical development program. The other process would be for a pharmaceutical company's sponsor to collect the data themselves, supporting the use of the biomarker for that program, and submit it in an IND to the review division. Um, there are um, processes in place to request meetings um, to learn whether the uh, review division is comfortable accepting the biomarker for that particular context of use. And that's a much more straightforward, quick process. So qualification has certain advantages, uh, but it's not necessary in all cases. I wonder, um, we talked a lot about context of use yesterday and the importance of that. And, and maybe just to expand on what you're talking about from biomarkers, maybe pass it down to Gavin, if you have anything further to say in that realm. Sure. Yeah, I would add that, you know, um, this really gets back to the to the age old and 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 really big picture question is which is does the investigational product work and um, you know there's so many inputs in terms of our understanding of the pathogenesis uh, of a particular disease um, and the role for a a biomarker it may have a life um, entirely independent of being construed as a biomarker before it is a biomarker um, and. Um, you know, we've seen biomarkers that are um, developed or conceived of um, early on in a in a in more of a hypothesis driven way, and others that are really driven by um, a mode of 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 discovery. Um, so, how context of use um, evolves and how fitness of for use in a particular indication evolves, um, we recognize as being you know, quite um, messy business. Um, there's not really a linear path for that. And so um, one of the things that that I think we find helpful in, in CBER, particularly because this is layered on to a lot of complexity with regard to um, the product, um, to say nothing of the clinical design considerations, um, is to understand um, how the sponsor is, um, uh, is really conceiving of the particular biomarker in the, um, in the development program. And embedded within that, the uncertainties. Um, we don't expect, particularly in in early development, for that to be, um, you know, such an such an ironclad thing. I think it's very helpful as we begin to think through how particular trials and endpoints um, might be um, advanced or subordinated one against another, and what a clinical development program might look like. It really helps us to have an understanding of the of, of really those big picture considerations. So um, I really encourage um, a, a a liberal approach to to to, to sharing that um, that development process um, and and you know along with it all of the um, the uncertainties and um, and the, and the ways that the sponsor is conceiving of things. They're they're really I think sometimes there may be a a temptation to um, to portray a a greater degree of, of of certainty and conviction in what a development program might might look like, but we all recognize that this is a bidirectional process. It requires a lot of interaction, um, and it requires co learning. In Cebra, we're learning to regulate products as sponsors are learning how to develop them. So. Um, I think being humble about that from from both the FDA perspective and the sponsor perspective is is a really helpful guiding light in in, in overall development. Julia, did you did you want to add anything or? I mean, I, I mean, I echo what what Gavin said. I mean, similar considerations are true in Center for Drugs. Um, you know, in the context of use, depends on the particular. Uh, product um, development and, and where does it fit in the you know pathogenesis of the disease you know target engagement and as well you know how well is it correlated I mean how much data we have about natural history of um, of, of the particular clinical outcome but also the trajectory uh, of the biomarker within the context of the natural history so that definitely informs um, you know whether or not the the particular biomarker fits uh, for use um, in that particular development program so it's key by key basis, uh, but certainly there are possibilities where across the different programs, a similar biomarker could be used, um, you know, depending on, on the particular mechanism of action of, uh, of a product. Yeah, so 
to to the industry colleagues up here in, in that in that context, you know, in terms of differences is in MOA and the the application of data or the absence or or usually limited amount of data. What are key? Um, what are types of alternative trial designs that could be leveraged? Um, you know, to be used for to foster collaboration and and that type of thing. <clears throat> Christina, I'll give it for first to you, and then. To, um, yeah, uh, I um, I think that could it is necessary in the future, of course, um, for us to be in a pre-competitive stage. Um, but it will also co have, we really need to figure out how to work around it because you need to have compounds that that can be in a kind of basket if it was that uh, design. And uh, and then you need to have really um, quality data for a, a placebo group that could be used in in more trials. Um, I also think one problem that could be maybe solved uh, a little earlier were to have a more aligned uh, process in uh, different global agencies, so that you'd need not to develop different protocols in uh, Europe and in US, for example, because most of us need to have patients from more than one country. Go ahead. So I think I agree. And I think if we think about uh, natural history, I think it can be really an important source to help mitigate the challenges with the limited number of patients and trying to reduce the number of placebo, uh, uh, the placebo arm. So if we have robust natural history, that uh, and especially a, a large database that allows us to do the, the appropriate matching to the trial arm, I think it can be very helpful to try to mitigate this problem. And we heard yesterday how impactful it can be if you reduce the likelihood that you'll fall into a placebo arm to uh, the willingness to participate in a trial. It also accelerates, of course, uh, the trial completion because you have to recruit less patients. So I think this is definitely a, a very powerful uh, tool that can be leveraged. But for that, I think we also need robust data. And in rare diseases, sometimes this is hard to do alone. And I think that's where collaboration comes in. We see different registries, different countries, maybe combining data from these different registries, standardizing data collection for the important variables so that these data can be leveraged. And I think the patient groups have really instrumental role there to maybe bring these uh, different registries together along with the industry to work in a, in a way to standardize and amplify the data collection yeah. so it can be leveraged. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that, John? And Yeah, I, I just, well, um, not on that specifically. I think, I think Ed's uh, points are, are great. Um, but I think in alpha, um, especially given the pipeline that we have right now, um, I think it would be, it, it seems to me a good candidate, at least on paper for like an umbrella trial design and basically cut in half your need for anyone, the need for uh, people to be on off product and on placebo. So, um, you know, I, I think that's something that we should be looking into in this, in the next couple of years. Yeah, I think that's great. And as, as the consortium gets going, I think we'll deepen these conversations. And as we learn more about the different alpha patient groups and, potentially matching them up. But I think Jonathan had a question for the panel. <laughs> so I have a question about collaboration and biomarkers. So I, I know we have a, uh, there's one lab that's looking at, um, let me get it right, neurofilament light chains, right? Which um, for NPC. And I know that they have just been approved for some form of ALS, I think as a biomarker as well. Is there a clearinghouse? Is there a place where, Literally, people say, here's a biomarker that might work for this kind of disease or whatever, where it can be tested, where at least uh, at least uh, through using computational science, uh, we could find out whether there's potential for that biomarker to be useful. And if there's potential, then we could say to one of our labs, please start an experiment with that, with, you know, with animals or whatever. Does that kind of clearinghouse exist? 
PubMed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure what a clearinghouse like that would look like. I mean, I can make a few comments on neurofilament light. Um, if you look at the literature, there's tremendous interest in neurofilament light as a biomarker of uh, neurodegeneration, damage to neurons. Um, <clears throat> the way it behaves in different diseases is different. Um, I understand that in multiple sclerosis, it's considered a very good biomarker, but in other conditions, it um, shows less of a correlation with clinical outcomes. Um, in the particular case you're talking about, which is the approval of Tofersen, well, um, yeah, the approval of Tofersen uh, for uh, SOD1 ALS, um, neurofilament light was used as a reasonably likely surrogate for approval. Um, <clears throat> this was a very specific instance where um, the product reduced the level of the um, pathogenic uh, protein, SOD1, in the CNS, and um, therefore, uh, neurofilament light in that particular situation could be used as a reasonably likely surrogate. In other diseases, you would need to show the connection to clinical outcomes. But uh, could you expand more on what a clearinghouse, like what you were talking about, would look like? So I'm not a scientist, so I'm not sure exactly what it would look like, but uh, it would be a a repository for information about biomarkers that have been developed for given diseases or that are being developed, where there's a hypothesis that this biomarker might be useful for this purpose. Um, and it would be a place where somebody could go, or even better, computationally, their uh, additional hypotheses could be generated about the usefulness of that biomarker for a different disease. And then if there's enough evidence, then we could send it to a lab and they could test it out. So, so let me jump in real quick because, um, so that I'm, I'm not sure that Klaus would like me calling uh, CPLD a, a clearinghouse, but, uh, you know, that's kind of what, you know, what, what we're doing. So not that we're a clearinghouse per se, but, you know, the, the landscape analysis that's been conducted in the pre-consortium time uh, has specifically I tried to identify uh, viable biomarkers that are across a subset, a, as large of a subset as we could find um, for, you know, we're starting with with CNS involvement. And NFL, obviously, because of a, a number of reasons with the success, as Dr. Siegel said, in MS, um, but also the um, the the approval in the ALS as a safety efficacy endpoint kind of um, a checkpoint. So that is obviously one of our um, biomarkers that we're starting with. So in terms of that, we are in the process of the process of aggregating data, working with stakeholders to try to get as much uh, data for NFL in um, less somal diseases as, as possible. Uh, unlike some of the other diseases that, that have tested it more efficiently and effectively, uh, there, the data doesn't exist as of yet. But the improvement in assays to allow for the um, testing in blood product, serum or plasma, has uh, relatively opened up that, that space. And so that's part of what we're, what we're trying to do. Uh, also in that, in our, in our clearinghouse uh, hat, we are trying to aggregate um, imaging data so that we can, as um, Dr. Siegel alluded to and, and some others, that we can see if there is a potential context of use, is there the potential, potential correlation in which we could then say this is a potential high quality biomarker. Let's see how much breadth and depth we can expand on that to try to uh, get closer to drug development, drug development tools, that type of thing. And Klaus is there, so I will let him uh, take the floor for a moment. Yeah, just a just a reaction to to what has been discussed in the panel. So, and in, in, uh, Jonathan, thank you for the for the commentary. Uh, so, two things, precisely what you mentioned about trying to learn as much as we can from as many diseases as possible is part of why the FDA had the vision to set up a, a public private partnership, not focused on 
one public private partnership for 40, 50, 60, 70 potential lysosomal diseases, but one consortium for all of them. Because the FDA recognizes, and they, they came to us with that very specific ask, make sure that you integrate as much knowledge as possible across lysosomal diseases. And just as we had the conversation about how the neonatal consortium transformed the landscape of integration of real-world data, that was also something that, that came to us from the agency saying, we think you guys through that consortium can transform this. And now everybody's learning all those valuable lessons about integration of real world data. The Lysosomal Consortium is in a unique and advantageous position to lead the way in how to integrate data and knowledge across as many diseases as possible. But I also want to go back to the, the comment that Jeff mentioned right now about uh, Tofersen and NFL. I was part of that advisory committee. And two things happened in that advisory committee meeting that were pretty unique. First of all, the questions that the FDA awarded for the panel, those questions were highly specific, highly driven, and left very little room for misinterpretation. And they were linked to exactly what was being presented in the data. The data were compelling for the questions being asked. But there were many other aspects of the data that were being shown that linked to questions that were completely out of scope for that conversation. And so the, the learnings from that advisory committee were not just that, of course, Tversen got approved, fantastic, great news for the ALS community. But to me, the most valuable lesson learned was how the FDA linked the questions with the data being presented. And so just want to make sure that that got, got, that got highlighted. That was it. Thank you. Okay. Well... Um, so CPATH is all about collaboration. We've talked a lot about industry, bringing industry and all these diverse stakeholders together to collaborate, but I just want to expand on that collaboration a little bit for, and, and we've even talked about regulatory collaboration globally and how the regulatory bodies work together, but these complex issues require complex thought process and, and unique perspectives on the disease and maybe a vulnerable population layered into that. So, Yulia, I just wonder if you could maybe, coming from the Rare Disease and Medical Genetics Office, talk about how you collaborate internally to bring together the right knowledge base when um, these rare diseases come up and, and are being reviewed, not only from um, the therapeutic area expertise, the rare disease, medical genetic expertise, and maybe even population-based, how you bring those experts together and collaborate. Thank you, Gina, for, for this question. I think, you know, this this particular meeting is very much uh, showing you that FDA collaborates across different uh, centers, different offices. You know, you've seen representative from multiple divisions in the panels here the part of this uh, consortium um, development, um, you know, Jeff is here on the panel, you know, um, uh, Emily was on, on the previous one and, um, you know, on and on and on and on, you know, we have Seabury Cedar representatives um, and uh, we internally definitely confer uh, routinely on the individual indications to see what the level of data currently is being shared across the uh, drug development field and, you know, biologic development field for that matter, um, to see what the evidence um, uh, that we currently have available, um, both on the on the um, uh, investigational or interventional uh, side, but also on the natural history side. Um, so there, there are multiple opportunities that we uh, we do have um, joint meetings where we share the data, we discuss uncertainties, the past forward, um, the sponsors proposal, um, critique them and making sure that we will be able to select the best path forward that we can coordinate across different offices. So we present a united front in, in order to enhance the product development in um, these uh, critical, you know, unmet medical need um, diseases uh, that we have. Um, so, you know, I, I can speak for rare disease, medical genetics, lysosomal disease, but I'm sure it's a similar type of a very collaborative attitude across uh, different divisions, different centers uh, within OND, uh, CEDAR and CBER. 
And then uh, just, uh, Christine, do you want to, I mean, I obviously not re in regulatory, but, you know, from, from a um, more global perspective, w what are you seeing in terms of industry with, with regulatory um, involvement and, and collaboration and how can we better, you know, make it a, a global approach to addressing some of these unmet needs? Yeah. I was talking to Christine. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not in regulatory, right. so, <laughs> but but I definitely think in this uh, rare space that we need to have um, alignment um, with what is the regulatory goals, what is the endpoints, the biomarkers, um, because it it's often small biotech companies who start these trials and it costs a lot of money. So uh, if it could be just a little bit more simple. I think it could be great. <laughs> um, and I also think I also wanted a comment around uh, our our need for natural history. Um, I it could be really of big big value if every patient who were diagnosed with a rare disorder were, were automatically included in a registry and had a consent of the use of data. Um, that will help us all. Yeah, I, I think that's a great place to to close it out and where we uh, hope that CPATH can kind of fill some of the gaps to to bring together the data, to get people more aware of how we shared, how to make sharing data a little bit more easy. Um, but I want to thank all of the panelists. Thank you. Great conversation.